So I want to discuss a sequence of episodes in Carnap's thinking about mathematics, beginning with his doctoral dissertation, Der Raum, which represents the most explicitly Kantian episode in his thought, I, most, I'm not saying it is Kantian, <laughs> proceeding to some developments leading from there up to the Aufbau, then turning to the logical syntax of language, where the principle of tolerance is first officially formulated, and finally considering a couple of episodes in his thinking from the following semantic period and beyond. I should caution you at the outset about the possibly misleading implications of my title. Actually, as I started writing the paper, I realized how misleading the title was, but it still, it leads somewhere. For I do not mean to imply a transition from a doctrinal commitment to a central role in the epistemological grounding of mathematics for some kind of intuition, whether Kantian, Husserlian, Brauerian, or Gerdelian, on Carnap's behalf, to a more relaxed and pluralistic approach involving a tolerant appreciation of a variety of epistemological strategies. Nothing could be further from the truth that, is, that, that, uh, that this, this could be the transition. For Carnap is just as tolerant in this sense in Der Raum, the main point of which is to argue that logical and formalistic approaches to space and geometry, as in Russell or Hilbert, empirical or physical approaches, as in Hemholtz or especially Einstein, and intuition-based approaches in the Kantian, Neo-Kantian, and Husserlian traditions all have an important element of truth. It is just that these three different approaches are talking about three different types or meanings, as, Car as Carnap puts it, of space, formal, physical, and intuitive space. And although Carnap abandons the idea of intuitive space in the sense of der Raum by the time of the Aufbau, he preserves important aspects of Kantian and Neo-Kantian epistemology in this work and even beyond. We get a better sense of Carnap's characteristic approach to the philosophy of mathematics and to philosophy more generally if we take seriously his claim that, repeated many times, throughout his career, that he actually held no philosophical positions in the usual sense at all. Here are some that we've already seen. Um, I'll just look at a couple of them. When he was looking at the Logischer Aufbau, he became aware that he used different philosophical languages when talking to different friends, idealist, realist, materialist, and so on. With some, he says, I talked a language which might be labeled nominalistic. With others, again, Frege was language of abstract entities of various types, a language which some contemporary authors call platonic. This is quotation number one on your handout. I'm gonna show you all of them and you can also keep that unreadable handout. By the way, there may be people who came in late and didn't get a handout. If so, maybe people can share them where that is true. But uh, you'll see it on the screen anyway. Uh, second one, when asked, I love this one, when asked which philosophical position I myself held, I was unable to answer. My way of thinking, he says, was neutral with respect to the traditional controversies, e.g. realism versus idealism, nominalism versus Platonism materialism versus spiritualism and so on. He didn't want to opt for any philosophical position in any of these ism pairs. Uh, finally, he mentions the, uh, this is all in three successive pages in the autobiography, this neutral attitude toward the various philosophical forms of life based on the principle that everyone is free to use the language he wants has remained the same throughout my life. It was formulated as principle of tolerance in logical syntax, that's the official one, and I still hold it today for example, with respect to the contemporary controversy about a nominalist or platonic language. Okay. Well, this is, I'm gonna say, you're gonna see this slide a lot, uh, is really misleading in a sense on Carnap's part in that he's suggesting that the principle of tolerance is really just a kind of formalization of what he always thought or always. So I'm saying there is a kind of general philosophical tolerance that was the same, but the principle of tolerance in syntax is something very unique and special. So that's the transition I really uh, have in mind. If we look at some of the debates in the philosophy of mathematics that Carnap participated in, we can see that this kind of claim is quite true. Thus, during the early 1930s, when he was working on logical syntax and engaged in serious discussions with Gödel, it's easy to see that Carnap's approach, especially in comparison with Gödel's, can be described as nominalistic as opposed to platonic. For Carnap simply takes it for granted that the only scientifically meaningful existence assertions are those concerning physical objects in space and time. The entire set theoretical or type theoretical, right, Carnap moves between those, hierarchy of natural numbers, sets of natural numbers, sets of sets of natural numbers, and so on, is simply a more or less convenient device for setting up 
a mathematically tractable coordinate system for representing whatever spatiotemporal magnitudes, mass, charge, the electromagnetic magnetic field, and so on, that there happen to be according to physics. And there is no substantive question concerning whether one or another mathematical representative of such physical entities, coordinates, vectors, tensors, whatever, there's no discussion about whether those really exist or not for Carnap. Nevertheless, when Carnap is, re is responding in empiricism, semantics, and ontology to the explicitly nominalistic philosophical predilections of Goodman, Quine, and Tarski, who he was discussing uh, with at Harvard, Carnap rather defends the system of abstract entities, in this case natural numbers, assumed in standard Peano arithmetic. That is, he defends what he takes to be a platonic, as opposed to nominalistic form of language in the sense of quotation three. Right. So he moves back and forth depending on who he's talking to. Okay, with these preliminary cautions understood, I will begin my narrative with De Raum, which, as suggested, involves the most explicit appeal to the Kantian conception of spatial intuition in all of Carnap's works. It represents the final product in particular of Carnap's studies at the University of Jena with the neo-Kantian philosopher Bruno Bauch, as he says in the autobiography, before he even got to Der Raum, uh, when he read the Critique of Pure Reason, he was impressed, as he says, by Kant's notion that the geometrical structure of space is determined by the form of intuition. And as he says, there are after effects of this notable to say the least, in, uh, in Der Raum. Yep. The first chapter, though, is on formal space, and it begins with an exposition of logic following Carnap's most important teacher at Jena, Gottlob Frege, and then turns, as suggested, to an exposition of both axiomatic and what we now call set-theoretic or type-theoretical developments of the pure, purely formal structure of space. And here, one of the things he clearly has in mind is the theory of relations as developed in by Russell. But it is in the second chapter on intuitive space that Carnap attempts to modify the originally Kantian, globally Euclidean structure of our form of outer spatial intuition in order to accommodate the use of a non-Euclidean geometry of variable curvature in Einstein's general theory of relativity. The centerpiece of this second chapter on intuitive space is Carnap's modification of Hilbert's axiomatization of Euclidean geometry. Carnap takes Hilbert's axioms of incidence and order correctly to describe the necessary a priori structure of any limited local region of space as immediately to present it to us in Husserlian Wesenserschauen. When it comes to the metrical, metrical structure, however, Carnap reformulates Hilbert's axioms of congruence and parallels via a kind of limiting procedure so that specifically Euclidean geometry following Riemann is valid only in the very smallest regions, that is, in infinitely small regions or infinitesimal regions, what we would call the tangent space. So there's the local structure where you, he says you have Hilbert's axioms of incidence and order, the infinitesimal structure, which is Euclidean, and the global structure finally can be determined only by what Carnap calls postulates for der Rungen, for der Rungen which stipulate how the local and infinitesimal structures fit together within a single, as he puts it, comprehensive spatial structure. Carnap chooses these postulates in such a way, although it's only one choice, as to allow maximal but continuous variability in the curvature from point to point, so as thereby to prepare the way for the accommodation discussed at length in the third chapter, physical space, of Einstein's use of a semi riemannian <coughs> geometry of variable curvature. So these are all the characters or a number of the characters that are important for him there. Uh, before proceeding to the third chapter, however, I should observe that there is a fundamental mistake with Carnap's modification of Hilbert's axioms. In particular, Hilbert's axioms of incidence are not even locally valid in general in a three-dimensional Riemannian manifold. Consider Hilbert's axiom 1.6. If two points of a line lie in a plane, then every other point of the line lies in the same plane. Right? So, this is now, this is not a, a curved surface in three-dimensional Euclidean space. It's a plane, a flattest possible surface in three-dimensional Riemannian space. So this plane is introduced locally with respect to this point P, right? The neighborhood is the neighborhood of P. And these lines here are geodesics that all go through P and that are all tangent. I didn't draw this because it's hard to draw and it makes things messy. It's tangent to a particular two-dimensional subspace of the tangent space at T, at P, okay, which is Euclidean. 
So you, this is sometimes called the exponential map from the tangent space into a neighborhood of the Riemannian manifold, right? So the geodesics are all of these things that go through Q and P. They're the straightest possible, shortest possible lines in the plane so defined, right? But continue, uh, whoops, consider two points Q and R, uh, which are not P, are not P. And so it doesn't follow that the, ge the unique geodesic that, con that connects Q and R lies on this surface, right? In general, it doesn't lie on the surface. Uh, so, for example, it could go through underneath here and intersect the surface only at these two points. Right? And you, if you wanted to draw the appropriate surface in which this geodesic lived, you would consider something exponentially generated from one of these other two, but not from P in general. Okay. Don't understand the diagram. Okay. I think all three points are supposed to be on the same line. Two points of the line. No, if two points of a line lie on a plane, then every other point of the line, so let this be the line. So in other words, the line is going to be a geodesic connecting Q and R, this dotted thing. I would make it curve, but I couldn't do dots in PowerPoint. The two points first mentioned are not P and Q. They're Q and R. Okay. So there is a geodesic connecting Q and R. In general, it's not on this surface. So, okay, good. When, when Steve starts saying I made a mathematical mistake. <laughs> I start sweating, but I feel better. Okay. So uh, there is no alternative in the end but to take all of Hilbert's axioms, that is incidence, order, and congruence, as valid only infinitesimally, as opposed to the topological. This is the projective, local projective structure. Uh, it's not going to be there. It's only going to be local topological structure, okay. which is later what he says in a, in a moment. So you can't modify Hilbert's axioms this way. The third chapter of Deram on physical space undertakes to treat intuitive space as a Kantian form of intuition in a generalized sense, right? generalized with Einstein in mind. The generalization is mediated by a central distinction Carnet makes between freely chosen or optional Wahlfreier form and necessary Notwendiger form, where only now local topological structure comprehends the facts of perceptual experience within necessary form and thereby presents them uniquely. And that's correct, right? As I said, every, every differential manifold, in fact, that's part of the definition, is locally homeomorphic to some uh, Rn. Okay. Uh, so only local topological structure comprehends the facts of perceptual experience uniquely and thereby presents them uh, with necessary form and therefore uniquely independent, that is, of the freely chosen metrical stipulations that are then laid down by convention for Carnap. <clears throat> right. In this way, the immediate deliverances of Husserli and Wesenserschauung provide our perceptual experience with the structure of a form of intuition in something like the original Kantian sense, but the intuitive space in question is compatible with all possible Riemannian metrical structures. And this, this is all fine. If we want a single spatial structure containing all of these possible optional determinations in Carnap's language, we adopt n-dimensional topological space, but no particular one of the infinity of possible n-dimensional metrical spaces. And this is basically the last paragraph of the book where Con Ar uh, sorry, Carnap argues that in place of the Kantian global Euclidean structure, the only a priori experience constituting uh, structure that we have now can be precisely specified as topological intuitive space with indefinitely many dimensions. Why indefinitely many? Because we don't know, we can't fix the dimension a priori, he thinks. Intuition tells us it's at least three dimensional, but it doesn't tell us how many more there are. That has to be decided on the basis of conventions in physics. So to get uniqueness, you just leave it variable n. While necessary form comprehends the topological spatial features, that are intrinsically present in our form of spatial intuition, in our Wesenserschauung, so all of our perceptual acts. Right? Um, optional form comprehends the additional metrical spatial characteristics that are not built into our a priori spatial intuition at all, but are nonetheless also indispensable in physics via a freely chosen metric stipulation for mathematically describing the facts of experience and allowing measurement and so on. The generalized Kantian distinction between necessary and optional form articulated in Der Raum also figures centrally in Carnap's 1924 paper 
Dreidimensionalität des Raumes und Kausalität, and we've heard about this already. Carnap begins this paper by distinguishing between experience of the first level and experience of the second level, between primary and secondary worlds, insofar as the first, primary, is subject to a univocal or necessary formation, not wendiger formung, whereas the second subjects this univocal structure to a further non-univocal reformation, umformung. This distinction depends in particular on, quote from Carnap, the necessity, not wendigkeit, of the forms of the first level and the freely chosen character, Wahlfreiheit, of the forms of the second, which is manifested by the presence of different types of secondary worlds, unquote. So the secondary world is the world of physics, the primary world is the world of immediate uh, subjective experience. So the most important of the alternatives that you have in physics are described uh, in the 1923 paper, Über die Aufgabe der Physik. Right? So now he's turning to the relationship between the subjective experience, which has a certain necessary topological form, and uh, the, the physical <coughs> description built on top of that, which doesn't have any necessary form. Okay. Yet, and so the 1924 distinction between primary and secondary worlds introduces an important new element not present in der Raum, a transition from two to three dimensions in the respective spaces of the two worlds. The space exhibiting necessary form is not three-dimensional intuitive cum physical space, which is what it was in Der Raum, but rather the two-dimensional topological space of the visual field and perhaps other sense modalities. The 1924 paper thereby introduces a further epistemological problem, a kind of an empiricist epistemological problem, namely of depicting the route from private subjective experience to the external physical world, which of course is taken up and developed in the Alpha. So that was my route to the Aufbau. In the Aufbau, however, there is no remaining trace of the notion of necessary perceptual form at all, and thus no remaining trace of either Kantian spatial intuition or the synthetic a priori. So here's a few things from, uh, from the Aufbau. Uh, he, he has these two different tasks, defining or constituting an object, and then investigating the non-constitutional properties um, according to the conception of constitutional theory, there are no other components of cognition besides these two, namely the conventional, that is the definitional, and the empirical, that is the investigation of the further properties after you've defined something, and thus no synthetic a priori. This becomes a little bit clearer when he points out uh, a little bit in the same paragraph. The point is only finitely many determinations, that is only finitely many constructions in type theory, as it were, suffice for the constitution of an object. It's gonna exist somewhere in the hierarchy, and thus for its univocal definite description among the objects in general. Once such a definition description is set up, the object is no longer an X, that is something that is yet to be set as a task, aufgegeben, namely it is univocally determined, it's gegeben, whose complete description still remains an incompletable task, and he indicates clearly that he's got the Marburg School in mind, who have the so-called genetic theory of knowledge, according to which all objects of experience are these never-to-be-completed X's, okay? which is partly a reinterpretation of the Ding an Zik and so forth. Uh, but Carnap is saying, I reject their residual adherence to synthetic a priori because I'm saying in a finite number of steps, every X is gonna be constituted if it exists in the sense of constitutional theory. And then we go on to doing science in infinity, but that's a different story. That's empirical, the first is definitional. Nothing synthetic a priori. Thus, Carnap's rejection of the synthetic a priori here in the Aufbau essentially involves a crucial modification of the gen genetic erzeugende conception of cognition, characteristic of the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism, whose most important representatives for Carnap in the Aufbau are Paul Mattorp and Ernst Kassir. Uh, Natorp is the less regal looking character, of course. I say modification as opposed to just rejection because Carnap by no means rejects this version of neo-Kantianism completely. He's perfectly happy in accordance with his general attitude of tolerance, this more general thing, concerning epistemological questions in the Aufbau, explicitly to acknowledge what he takes to be the significant epistemological theses that he shares with them. So we've also talked about this. He says we have both positivism and transcendental idealism. They're both right. 
positivism about the basic elements, which are not yet have any logical structure to them. Um, they're undigested. Um, those are the basic elements, but transcendental idealism, especially this tendency, has rightly emphasized that these elements do not suffice. Order posits must be added our basic relation. And then we investigate the logical structure of such relations in accordance with their idea. That comes up more clearly in the next quotation. All objects of cognition are constituted, he says, in idealistic language are generated in thought, im denken erzeugt. And moreover, the constituted objects are only objects of cognition, qua logical forms, constructed in a determinate way. And again, it's clear he's taking transcendental idealism to basically be uh, a reference to the Marburg version, although he includes the Southwest here too, by the uh, erzeugende uh, conception that he's appealing to. Okay. So in particular, although Carnap rejects the Marburg commitment to the synthetic a priori, he agrees with their gene genetic con conception against what he takes to be overly crude versions of empiricism, that the characterization of empirical objects via logical forms is essential to their proper scientific cognition. And he later says, even the basic elements finally have to be picked out by logical form. Okay, in sum, the only a priori experience constituting elements that Carnap now accepts are formal logical ones, not intuitive ones, not in a Nordwendiger form. And for space in particular, the only such elements that he now accepts are those which in Der Raum he took to be elements of formal space, that is purely logical characterizations of structures. Thus, in the Aufbau, Carnap constructs what he calls the perceptual world, and then the world of physics, by beginning with R4, embedding the sensory qualities in the autopsychological realm, first the subject itself, that line is the autopsychological realm, but then we embed that along spatio-temporal lines of sight, as it were, onto the surfaces of candidate physical objects. That's now the perceptual world. And finally, assigning mathematical representatives of various physical magnitudes, scalar fields, vector fields, and so on. Here we have the electromagnetic field, because we're explaining colors. Um, uh, sorry, uh, to points in R4 via what Carnap calls the physico-qualitative coordination which we've heard about. Okay. So that's how he sees the, uh, the constitution of the perceptual and then the physical world. Moreover, and in accordance in this respect with the conception of Der Raum, only the topological structure of R4 counts as experience constituting, but this is R4 as a formal space, in Carnap's construction, because, because both the division of R4 into representatives of three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time and the metrical properties of both space and time remain to be determined by a combination of experience and convention, that is constitution. <clears throat> Nevertheless, while, while the topological structure of R4 is just taken for granted. Right. Nevertheless, even though R4 is purely formal in this construction, right. they, what, what it means for Carnap is that space and time are thereby represented by purely formal, purely analytical mathematical entities in terms of a spatio-temporal coordinate system. But he does not identify space and time with those formal entities. On the contrary, space and time themselves are const constitutionally introduced as essentially perceptual and in this sense intuitive. That is, space and time as opposed to R4, are, you only get when you I embed into R4 qualities in the autopsychological realm onto sensory surfaces. That's space. R4 is not space, it's just the formal framework of space. And then, the physical space, which is, as it were, purely formal, it's not qualities, it's just numbers, but still, it's piggybacking on the back of perceptual space. That's how it's introduced. Right. For Carnap in the Aufbau, there therefore remains a crucial asymmetry between his conception of arithmetic and analysis on the one side, and his conception of geometry, both spatial and spatio-temporal on the other, and this asymmetry, as we shall see, persists throughout his career. So I'll come back to this point. Okay, so so much for the uh, pre-Aufbau and Aufbau half. The rest, uh, which will be slightly longer, will be on the post. Carnap's serious engagement with what we now call the philosophy of mathematics, and in particular what we now call the foundations of mathematics, begins in the next phase of his career, culminating in the publication of Logical Syntax in 1934. This phase begins, as Carnap makes clear in his autobiography, 
with the famous lecture Bauer presented, Bauer presented in Vienna in 1928. Right? Uh, the empiricist view of the circle was incompatible with any kind of res residue of Kant, he says, but the constructivist and finitist tendencies of Brouwer's thinking appeal to us greatly. Okay. Indeed, one can well understand why Carnap and the circle were attracted to these constructivist and finitist tendencies, because they dovetail nicely with the finitist conception of the principle of verifiability that the circle found in both Wittgenstein's Tractatus and quite explicitly in the Aufbau. So back to the Aufbau again. Uh, Everything is eventually going to be about elementary experiences when you do all these definitions. And verification, therefore, of any proposition about any object at any level in the system, which is empirical, is going to be in terms of elementary experiences. Right? And it's in principle possible, we assume, that you can always take a, an element, two elementary experiences and see whether it holds or not. And here's the crucial point. The number of elements, the basic experience in question, is finite. That, so therefore, he says, it is in principle possible to ascertain in a finite number of steps whether or not the state of affairs uh, question obtains. So it's a very strong, of course, that he's glossing over certain things, namely he's going to have highly non-constructivist in predicative definitions in his set theory, which is going to compromise this claim. Uh, but that's something he only starts talking about a couple of years later. Okay. But they associated reasonably enough uh, Brouwer with this kind of verificationist, finitist verificationism. Despite these attractive features for the circle of Brouwer's intuitionism, however, neither the circle nor especially Carnap could no long rest content with Brouwer. The most fundamental problem, especially in Carnap's case, was that to go along with Brouwer was to become entangled with the crisis in the foundations of mathematics that embroiled some of the leading logicians and mathematicians of the time. The immediate stimulus for this crisis were worries about the consistency of classical mathematics in the wake of the logical and set theoretical paradoxes that gave rise to three mutually opposing schools of thought. Formalism, represented by Hilbert and Bernays, attempted to save classical mathematics and logic by developing a formal consistency proof using only limited finitistic methods. Intuition, by contrast, represented by Brouwer and Hayting, mounted a revolutionary challenge to classical mathematics and logic based on a rejection of the law of excluded middle and other associated laws applied to quantification over infinite domains, even the natural numbers. And logicism finally attempted to preserve as much as possible of the original Frege russell conception of logic and mathematics in the context of the more radical proposals of both the intuitions and the formalists. So who's the representative of logicism at this point? Well, it was Carnap himself, himself who represented the, lo the logicist position. I hope you can read this. Uh, in this famous uh, symposium held in uh, September 1930 in Königsberg, uh, and there are the three papers which are in Putnam and Benassareth, and at least when I was a, a young person, uh, when you started studying philosophy of mathematics, this is, you started with these three papers, although usually you only read like the first few pages of each of these three papers. <laughs> So there's Carnap, there's Hating, and there's John von Neumann representing the formal side. It was Carnap himself who represented the logical position at a defining symposium that he himself organized under the auspices of the International Congress of the Physicists and Mathematicians in Königsberg in September 1930, where the other two viewpoints, as I say, were represented by Hating and von Neumann. Even here, when you get to the end of Carnap's you see that he clearly indicates that logicism in his sense needs to incorporate the valid insights of formalism and intuitionism. It's not exactly Frege and Russell logic, let alone Wittgenstein's logic. As is well known, the following discussion of the foundations of mathematics, after a piece by Neugebauer on Greek mathematics, there's the famous discussion that ends, and the very end of that discussion is Gödel's contribution, and at the very end of that, is where Gödel first announces to the world his incompleteness results. And I think it's pretty clear that Carnap had asked him to do that. Right. Why do I say that? Um, well, um, in his intellectual autobiography, Carnap reports that, without mentioning the symposium at this point, immediately before this symposium, Gödel had informed him, Carnap, of his epic-making results. Right. He explained to me his method of arithmetization, he told me he could prove that 
any formal system of arithmetic is incomplete and incompletable. This is a turning point in the development of the foundations of mathematics, certainly true. And then after thinking about these problems in metamathematics that Gödel is a culmination of for several years, the whole theory of language structure and its possible applications in philosophy came to me, Carnap, like a vision, the famous sleepless night in January 1939 when he was ill, right? So August 1930, Gödel explains to Carnap the result. September 1930, at the symposium that Carnap organized, Gödel announced, you know, Gödel is not eager to announce yet his results, especially before they're published, but since Carnap had been so nice and listened to him, and so he did it. Okay. In any case, the project of logical, but it is important to see the importance of Gödel for his project. The project of logical syntax at this point was well underway, and it is this project, of course, that marks Carnap's own distinctive contribution to the debate on the foundations of mathematics and to the so-called foundations crisis. So what does Carnap say? In conformity with the metamathematical methods of Hilbertian proof theory, Carnap views any formulation of logic and mathematics as a syntactically described formal system where the notions of well-formed formula, axiom, derivation, theorem, and so on can all be syntactically expressed. In light of Gödel's recently published incompleteness results, however, Carnap does not pursue the Hilbertian project of constructing a proof of the consistency of classical mathematics using finitary means acceptable to the intuitionist. He takes this to be uh, something you can't do now. Instead, Carnap formulates both a formal system or calculus conforming to the scripture, strictures, strictures, constraints of intuitionism, this is language one, a version of primitive recursive arithmetic, and a much stronger system adequate for full classical mathematics, language two, a version of higher order type theory over the natural numbers as individuals, but with any axioms you want to add, choice, and so on, you just put them there. For both systems, moreover, Carnap defines a notion of logical truth, analyticity, intended syntactically to express the essential independence of such truth, analytic truth, from all factual content. Finally, and most importantly, Carnap officially formulates for the first time the principle of tolerance. This we all know by heart. Um, and the so both types of system, intuitionist and full classical, should be syntactically described and investigated, and the choice between them, if there is one, should then be made on practical or pragmatic grounds rather than prior philosophical commitments or even philosophical considerations. Directly following his discussion of Brouwer's visit to Vienna, that was in quotation 10, Carnap presents a succinct uh, description in the autobiography of his syntax view. Yes, it's important to distinguish constructivist and non-constructive methods and to represent them by different formal systems. And of course, to have an informed choice about them, we have to know what their syntactic properties are. It's true that certain procedures, e.g. those admitted by constructivism or intuitionism, are safer than others. He takes that to be less likely to be contradictory. Remember, it's primitive recursive arithmetic, not hating arithmetic that he puts here. Therefore, it is advisable to apply these procedures as far as possible. There are other forms of methods, however, which, though less safe because we do not have a proof of their consistency, appear to be practically indispensable for physics. So, as long as we don't have a contradiction, when we're doing physics, we're going to use them basically. As we know, the principle of tolerance then becomes central to Carnap's philosophy from this point on. It is important to appreciate, however, that despite what Carnap suggests in quotation number three, and now I'm going to show it to you in a few more times, this principle goes very far beyond the non-committal and neutral attitude towards opposing philosophical positions that he had maintained throughout his earlier career, and in a certain sense throughout his whole career. In the first place, modern logic and mathematics had furnished the uncontentious neutral platform for Carnap in all of his works up until now. In Der Raum, as we have seen, he appealed to the logic of Frege and Russell in his chapter on formal space, to Hilbert's axiomatization of geometry in his chapter on intuitive space, and the Riemannian theory of mathematical manifolds of any number of dimensions, both here in intuitive and especially in his chapter on physical space. Similarly, the logic of Principia Mathematica, to, together with elements of what we now call zermelo frankel set theory, here's Frankel, who Carnap worked with closely uh, during this period on set theory, and he talks about replacement, for example, I think even in syntax, constitutes the unquestioned formal framework for the Aufbau. Right? 
None of this is, is, is controversial for him. Indeed, Carnap's confidence in Principia Mathematica at this time is so strong that he confounds contemporary readers of the preface to the first edition by appealing to the contradictions that had precipitated the foundations crisis in order to praise modern Frege Russell logic at the expense of the traditional logic, the alte logik, right? The old traditional logic was an utter failure. It led to contradictions. This was the strongest motive for the development of the new logic. It avoided the contradictions, but aside from this merely negative service, it has already given proof of its positive capabilities, though only by examining and reestablishing, that is after the contradictions, the foundations of mathematics. So there's a rather disingenuous rhetoric here, to say the least. Uh, the, the last sentence somehow points toward the true situation. I mean, only modern logic leads to the, and modern mathematics leads to these contradictions, right? Not the syllogism. Okay. Now, however, it is precisely the modern logic developed by Frege and Russell, including Principia Mathematica, together with the foundations it had attempted to provide for modern classical mathematics, that is the problem, that is the issue. So it is far from clear what possible neutral framework for pursuing scientific philosophy and avoid hopeless philosophical disputes can still be available. I shall return to this question of neutrality soon. But I meanwhile want to note a further radically new element in Carnap's syntax approach to the foundations of mathematics and to his notion of analyticity. The Frege-Russell tradition had operated with revision of the original Kantian distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions that would be appropriate to the new logic. While Kant had appealed to both subject predicate containment and being in accordance with the law of non-contradiction uh, together with definitions, as criteria for analyticity, only a modification of the second criterion, be, being in accordance with all the laws of the new logic, together with definitions, was appropriate now. Moreover, the laws of the new logic in the Frege-Russell tradition were supposed to be distinguished by a special kind of maximal generality involving quantification over everything, and we heard something about this from Clinton, in comparison with the laws of the special sciences. If we could show that all of classical mathematics is derivable from such maximally general laws of logic, together with definitions, we would therefore have accomplished something quite substantial. For Carnap, however, the question of reducing mathematics to logic in some antecedently understood sense is now in syntax rather abruptly dismissed. So whether we use only logical signs in the narrower sense, as Frege and Russell do, or we also have mathematical primitives, as actually Carnap does, by putting arithmetical primitives and indeed quantification over higher types everywhere. Right? It's not a question of philosophical significance, but only of technical expedience. Incidentally, the question is not even accurately formulated. We have in general syntax made a formal distinction between logical and descriptive signs. But a precise classification of the logical signs in our sense, which includes math and logic, into logical signs in the narrower sense, which Frege and Russell were looked, has so far not been given by anyone. Right. So there's no issue at all of reducing to logic in that other sense. Finally, as Carnap suggests in the last quotation, the key to his new conception of analyticity is the distinction between logical and descriptive signs. The basic idea is that analytic, that is L-valid propositions, are those that are valid independently of any descriptive signs that may appear in them, invariant under permutations of them, if you like, and are thereby independent in particular of all empirical facts about the world, which are what the descriptive signs describe. Analytic propositions in this sense are entirely empty of content, and as a result, Carnap holds that logico-mathematical propositions, logico-mathematical, are fundamentally instruments for inferring or or inferentially organizing the contentful propositions of empirical science rather than contentful propositions themselves. Carnap describes this conception at the very beginning of his career as, quote, being derived essentially from Frege. Again, the autobiography. It is the task of logic and mathematics to supply forms and concepts for everything else. Um, the nature of logic and mathematics can be clearly understood only if close attention is given to their application in non-logical fields, especially in empirical science. And what I'm suggesting is it's in by way of contrast with empirical science. And by the way, Carnap quickly makes it clear in his autobiography that this notion of empty of content owes a lot to the Tractatus as well as Frege, so that's important to notice. Once again, however, Carnap's view in syntax 
radically diverges from the tradition of Frege and Russell, including the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus. Four, uh, in ways that I haven't mentioned yet, for not only is the formal characterization of the distinction between logical and descriptive signs to which Carnap refers in section 17, language relative and therefore language variable, so it doesn't privilege classical mathematics in any way, but the characterization itself is subject to te technical difficulties. And Carnap, uh, Carnap thereafter quickly abandons it in his semantic period, where he is basically content, largely, to present the distinction in the case of any particular given language, L, simply by enumerating the logical signs. So it, we'll learn more about this. So it appears entirely unclear, once again, what is the force of Carnap's new conception of logical mathematical truth? It looks like it's totally trivialized. This is one of Quine's arguments, right? It's just a list. You haven't told us anything. The key to properly understanding Carnap's new emphasis on the importance of the analytic synthetic distinction in logical syntax is to appreciate the extent to which it has nothing in common with any foundational program, whether logicist, formalist, or intuitionist. Rather, according to precisely the principle of tolerance, the point of viewing the statements of logic and mathematics as analytic lies solely in our freedom to choose which system of logic and mathematics best serves the formal deductive needs of empirical science, not to explain what special kind of truth this is. Okay. Classical mathematics, for example, is much easier to apply, as we saw, especially in physics than intuitionist mathematics, while the latter being logically weaker for Carnap is less likely to result in contradiction. And here, this is from the semantic period. I'll show you the, the section in a, sec in a second. He's regarding mathematics now not as purely syntactically, right? If it's a pure calculus, there's no issue at all, right? But if we regard interpreted mathematics as an instrument of induction, not the calculus only, rather than as a system of information, then many of the controversial problems are recognized as being questions not of truth, but of technical expedience. And again, which is safer, which is more fruitful, and so forth. That's the only question there is. That's the point. So the key thing is it's an instrument for empirical knowledge. The choice between the two systems is therefore purely practi practical or pragmatic, and it should thus be sharply separated in particular from all philosophical disputes about what, what mathematical entities really are, independent platonic objects or mental constructions, for example, or which such entities really exist. Only natural numbers, for example, are also real numbers, that is, sets of natural numbers. This comes from one of the first and very important works of the semantic period, Foundations of Logic and Mathematics, and this is from section 29, which is interestingly called the controversies over foundations in scare quotes. So it's kind of interesting that there's a book titled Foundations of Logic and Mathematics, but when he gets to the question of foundations, it's in scare quotes. Well, the key is, this is the section on the application to empirical science, which is by far the longest section, but okay. Well, I'll, I'll have a lot more to say about this in a, in a moment. Carnap aims to use the new tools of metamathematics definitively to dissolve all such philosophical disputes once and for all, and to replace them instead with the much more rigorous and fruitful project of language planning, language engineering. We heard about this. Um, later, did he recognize, the inf after working with Frege, the infinite variety of possible <coughs> language forms? I gained the insight that one cannot speak of the correct language form, because various forms have different advantages in different respects. The latter insight led me to the principle of tolerance. This is the real new principle of tolerance. Thus in time, I came to recognize that our task is one of planning forms of language, not adjudicating which is philosophically correct or incorrect. They can be useful or not pragmatically for organizing empirical science in one or another context. This is a project which, as Carnap understands it, simply has no involvement whatsoever with any foundational or other epistemological program about mathematics. But what about Carnap's commitment to neutrality in connection with the principle of tolerance? Which he still embraces, he still is saying. Okay. Can he really dissolve the philosophical disputes in question from a standpoint that is neutral with respect to the very questions at issue? In particular, can he really dissolve the dispute between classical mathematics and intuitionism in an entirely non-questioning, begging way? Although this question is not itself discussed, um, focused on uh, in the exchange between Carnap and the intuitionist logician E.W. Beth in the Schilk volume, 
That is, intuitionism is not the explicit focus. Um, it's especially illuminating with respect to just this question, as we'll see. All the more so because this dispute does explicitly involve the relation between the principle of tolerance on the one side and mathematical intuition, now arithmetical, on the other. Okay. So it's very relevant to, uh, to our, and we'll see it's crucially relevant in a moment. The main criticism that Beth develops of the project of logical syntax, or, or qualification <laughs> of the project, we could say, is that the project of logical syntax requires what Beth calls a, quote, non-formal intuitive interpretation. So that the syntax project is less purely formal and less, less unrestrictedly tolerant than Carnap appears to realize. The crux of Beth's argument is that syntax itself is a kind of arithmetic, as becomes especially clear in a girdle numbering, for example. And viewed as an arithmetic, a Carnapian syntax language or meta-language may then have non-standard models, containing non-finite numbers, non-finite sequences of expressions, extending beyond the standard number 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 for finitely many times. So that in the case of syntax, there, be, there may be more than a finite number of numerals in a non-standard model, or derivations may have more than a finite number of steps. Clearly not what you want. Someone who understood Carnap's syntax language in accordance with such a non-standard mo model would systematically misunderstand Carnap's main inductive definitions, excuse me, and results. And so, Beth argues, Carnap must implicitly be assuming that the syntax language is understood in accordance with the standard model. Further, Beth claims, we are thereby faced with what Beth calls a, quote, limitation regarding the principle of tolerance, unquote. For although someone who understands Carnap's syntax language in the standard way, such as presumably Carnap, can understand someone who uses a non-standard interpretation, the perverse practitioner of syntax in accordance with a non-standard interpretation, whom Beth calls Carnap star, this person would never be able to understand the standard one, for this practitioner lacks precisely the standard understanding of the concept of finiteness. That's the whole point. Carnap, in his reply to Beth, entirely accepts Beth te Beth's technical point. And accordingly, he entirely accepts Beth's claim that, quote, we find in logical syntax also concepts which, this is now Carnap, though defined in a purely formal way, are clearly inspired by a non-formal interpretation, unquote. Carnap suggests that he understands the point in terms of his notion of an interpreted formal language or calculus in the sense of the semantical works that he developed after logical syntax. That's what we're talking about in interpreted language. Indeed, in Foundations of Logic and Mathematics, Carnap applies this notion to describe what he calls the customary interpretation of Peano arithmetic, where the calculus being interpreted is based on a term B, a one-place a one place functor, which is supposed to represent the successor function, and the predicate N. And then he describes the customary interpretation of the Peano system can be formulated this way. B designates the cardinal number zero. If dot, dot, dot designates a cardinal number, then functor successor designates the next one, i.e. N plus one, and designates the class of finite cardinal numbers. Hence, in this interpretation, the system concerns the progression of finite cardinal numbers ordered according to magnitude. Okay. Carnap is here appealing, this is section 21, and he's here appealing, this is the description of the elementary mathematical calculus and its interpretation. He's appealing back to uh, higher logical calculus, higher order logic, where he's done a kind of standard construction of Frege Russell cardinals already. Okay. All right. And in, but it's clear in any case that there is no doubt that Carnap is proposing the standard understanding of the concept of finiteness, just as Beth suggests. Right? He knows he's doing that, he's doing that. Now, let me just insert parenthetically something about geometry. Um, in Carnap's discussion of the interpreted geometrical calculi, on the other hand, which is in section 21 and 22, right after the controversy section, he says this is quite different. Carnap strongly maintains his asymmetrical attitude towards the cases of arithmetic and analysis on the one side and geometry on the other, now applying his distinction between logical and descriptive signs. This is your number 22. When we referred to mathematics in the previous sections, we did not mean to include geometry, but only the mathematics of numbers and numerical functions. 
To be sure, the geometrical calculi, aside from their interpretation, are not fundamentally different in their character from other calculi. But the customary interpretation of geometrical calculi are descriptive, while those of the mathematical calculi are logical. How so? Well, he goes on to explain, section 22. Quote, the customary interpretation of a geometrical calculus, quote, consists of a translation into the physical calculus, together with the customary interpretation of the physical calculus. End quote. And physicists, in contrast to mathematicians, quote, are concerned with a the theory of space, i.e. of the system of possible configurations and movements of bodies, section 22. Carnap goes on, the great achievement of modern Einsteinian physics, Carnap continues, is decisively to have shown that geometry in its customary interpretation is thus synthetic, but not a priori, section 27, 32, still. And so as Einstein himself suggests, now Carnap, the Kantian doctrine is based on a failure to distinguish between mathematical and physical geometry. And then it's clear he's referring to this paper, famous paper by Einstein on geometry and experience, where Einstein basically says, without this distinction, I couldn't have found the general theory of relativity. And here is Carnap's now English translation of Einstein's dictum from here. So far as the theorems of mathematics are about reality, they are not certain. So far as they're certain, they're not about reality. So Carnap takes this application to relativity theory to both confirm the asymmetry between geometry, arithmetic, and analysis, and to show the importance of the distinction between mathematical and physical geometry, therefore the importance of the analytic synthetic distinction, that is the distinction between logical and descriptive signs, that is logical and descriptive interpretations. Okay. Returning now to the reply to Beth in the Schilt volume, which is about arithmetic and analysis, not geometry, Carnap applies his semantical conception of an interpreted language to the meta-languages used in both syntax and semantics. I always presupposed, he says, both in syntax and semantics, that a fixed interpretation of the meta-language, ML, which is shared by all participants, is given. Since ML uses English words, it is assumed, and he's writing everything in English now, of course, it is assumed that these words are understood in their ordinary senses. What's the problem? Of course, the imaginary case constructed by Beth of Carnap and Carnap Star violates precisely this presupposition. As Carnap puts it, quote, Carnap Star does not use the meta language ML, but a language ML star, which, although it uses the same words and sentences, differs from ML, since some of the words and sentences have different meanings, that is, different interpretations, in a logical rather than descriptive interpretation. Yet Carnap is completely untroubled by this because he is simply assuming that an unproblematic understanding of the standard model of arithmetic is encapsulated in ordinary mathematical usage. There is no deep mystery here for Carnap. There is no need to puzzle ourselves over the question of how we somehow force an uninterpreted formal calculus to designate or refer to an intended model. We just give Tarskian disquotational clauses into a language that we already understand, namely English or whatever meta language. <coughs> Antecedent to antecedently un understood terms of ordinary mathematical language. Appealing to an intuitive grasp of the standard model adds nothing at all to this routine procedure of ordinary mathematical practice. Carnap is also completely aware, now the more interesting part, that there are similar cases of failure of communication more directly relevant to his use of the principle of tolerance in logical syntax. Again, you have to have a common language if you're going to discuss a agreement. But it may be the case that one of the two disputants can express in his own language certain convictions which he cannot translate into the common language, maybe into primitive recursive arithmetic. For example, a classical mathematician is in this situation with respect to an intuitionist, or to a still higher degree with respect to anomalous that won't even accept that there's an infinite number of numbers and doesn't accept the axioms of successor. Just as Carnap cannot communicate the standard interpretation of the concept of finiteness to Carnap's star, the intuitionist cannot understand, the, the philosophically convinced intuitionist, cannot understand the classical interpretation of unbounded existential quantification over the natural numbers. Does this, as Beth suggests, then imply a restriction or limitation of the principle of tolerance? It may at first appear that it does. For Carnap's application of the principle of tolerance to this case, again, that's this thing, 
poses the question in a syntactic or semantic meta-language whether to adopt the classical or intuitionist logical rules for a particular object language, for example, the language of physics. We weigh the relative safety from the possibility of contradiction of the intuitionist rules against the greater fruitfulness and convenience in physics of the classical rules, and then we make our choice pragmatically. But if the intuitionists cannot understand the rules of the classical framework, which are done in a kind of stronger meta-language, and cannot in particular, well, I just said that, understand the even stronger classical meta-language in which we formulate the rules, the definition of analyticity, which is a Tarski and truth definition for classical mathematics, then it would appear that our entire procedure simply begs the question against the intuitionist. It in, no, in no way do we have a neutral, shared meta-perspective for evaluating the two positions on an equal footing. I'm almost done. This argument against Carnap is certainly tempting. And I confess that I have myself succumbed to the temptation more than once. I now think, however, that it misses the essence of Carnap's conception, as it emerges particularly clearly in the reply to Beth. Just as in the case of our understanding of the standard model of arithmetic, Carnap presupposes that classical mathematics, as it is standardly practiced, is well understood. Indeed, classical mathematics for Carnap is a model or paradigm of clear and exact scientific understanding. And there is no way in particular to raise doubts about our understanding of this framework on the basis of independent, purely philosophical commitments. To be sure, the foundations crisis sparked by discovery of the paradoxes, especially in the context of Gödel's recent incompleteness results, raises serious technical questions relevant to the consistency of the classical framework. And this is precisely why, for Carnap, we should now take intuitionism seriously. To take it seriously, however, means that we entertain the proposal, starting from within the classical framework, that we should weaken its rules to make inconsistency less likely. There is nothing in Carnap's position blocking a classical mathematician from entertaining this option or even deciding then to adopt it. Carnap has therefore not begged the question about the choice between classical and intuitionist mathematics as he understands it. That a philosophically committed intuitionist mathematician cannot understand the choice as Carnap understands it is irrelevant for the situation in which we in fact find ourselves is, has arisen within the paradigmatically well understood practice of classical mathematics itself, right, which may have technical issues that can be raised, but no philosophical issues. Okay, one more paragraph. In 1936, at the very beginning of the semantical period, Carnap published von der Erkenntnistheorie zur Wissenschaftslogik, a paper that Alan Richardson first, I think, among the Carnap world, uh, emphasized the importance of from epistemology to the logic of science. By the way, this is at the very first, whoops, the very first, uh, con the, this conference where this appeared and Carnap's semantic phase began was also where uh, Tarski first publicly um, uh, gave, uh, gave a sketch of his theory of truth, which Carnap en enthusiastically embraced, although it was quite controversial among the, in the Vienna circle. So the, the semantic period is really uh, coincided with that. Okay, the point of this paper is to argue that all traditional epistemological projects, including Carnap's own earlier project in the Aufbau, must now be renounced as, quote, unklare mission aus psychologischen und logischen Bestandteilen. Alan loves to say. Das gilt auch von den Arbeiten unseres Kreises, meine eigenen früheren Arbeiten nicht ausgenommen. Clearly the Aufbau is referred to here. Carnap at this point is decisively and explicitly breaking with the entire epistemological tradition. Wissenschaftslogik in particular is in no way concerned with either explaining or justifying our scientific knowledge by exhibiting its ultimate basis, whatever the basis might be. It is rather concerned instead with crafting a new role for philosophy vis-a-vis -vis the empirical sciences that will maximally contribute to scientific progress by contributing to the development and clarification of mathematical in inferential frameworks for these sciences, the constructive part, while at the same time diffusing all the traditional metaphysical disputes and obscurities that have constituted, and according to Carnap, continue to constitute serious obstacles to progress in both philosophy, that is scientific philosophy, and the sciences. Carnap's philosophy of mathematics in the end is thus an anti-philosophical philosophy of mathematics 
or perhaps better, a new mathematical philosophy, which, in the famous words from logical syntax, aims at nothing more nor than less than to take the place of the inextricable un in dirbang problem gemeinges, as my philosophy meant, tritt der Wissenschaftslogik an die Stelle. Yet it is in precisely the way in which the idea of Wissenschaftslogik responds to and emerges out of a variety of serious foundational challenges faced by early 20th century thought, which, as we have seen, includes some of the deepest intellectual problems surrounding modern philosophy, that is early 20th century philosophy, logic, mathematics, and mathematical physics. It's in precisely this that Carnap's project acquires its undoubted philosophical significance and force. 